Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Michael Wayne. Michael is a co-founder of Detroit Riverside Capital and serves as the head of project management. He's responsible for the construction management, capital management, and investor relations for DRC projects. He holds a Bachelor's of Science in Entrepreneurship and Corporate Innovation from Indiana University Kelly School of Business. So an interesting thing about Michael is he is 25 years old. And he just completed his first development of 43 units. It's a mixed use space, uh, you know, raising $1.8 million, making it happen. It's interesting to hear part of that story and how he got to this point. Not many people at that age are developing projects successfully, and he's done just that. And then we go into how he's looking at, you know, over, or I think, $300 million in development, you know, part could, that could be under contract in the very near future. So he is scaling fast and looking towards that. And we talk about some different team members he's had that were crucial in making this happen and being successful. Michael, welcome to the show. I'm looking forward to this conversation. I do not know too many people who are doing what you're doing at 25 years old. Uh, and, and so I just think it's very impressive. I hope that it motivates the listeners, uh, you know, as well and shows them, hey, what can be accomplished. And, and just looking at uh, even some of the projects you were telling me about before we got started, I'm looking forward to hearing more about those as we get going as well. Tell us a little, though, about over the last few years, how you how you got into this this kind of commercial real estate and, and, and let's go into where you're at, what you're doing now. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you, Whitney, for having me on. Really appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to the opportunity to share my story today. So um, the story somewhat goes that I was uh, an Indiana Hoosier living down in Bloomington and I uh, graduated from there in 2018 with a degree in entrepreneurship and then supply chain management. And so I decided that, um, you know, despite being an entrepreneur my whole life and running lawn care companies, healthy vending machine businesses, photography businesses, um, that I really needed to get what I would consider, or at the time I called a real job. And so meaning W2, nine to five, working in a big city and, you know, give that a shot after school. So that's what I started doing. Um, lasted there for about 18 months. I, I worked for a consulting firm in downtown Chicago, lived down there, had a bunch of friends down there, a whole lot of fun, but, uh, just knew it wasn't really long-term for me. Didn't see myself at that company long-term and really didn't see myself, um, you know, sort of tolerating the nine to five lifestyle and, and, and really just having that entrepreneurial itch um, that I had to scratch. So a, a friend of mine at the time, his name was Alec, um, who's now become my business partner and one of my best friends. Him and I were at a similar point and uh, both realized that the entrepreneurial path was our, our way out, so to speak, and um, wanted to pursue something. So we started looking into different options, quickly recognized real estate was a very, very powerful tool. And if nothing else could be a means to create, you know, income that could be used for other purposes down the road. So we saw it as a good stepping stone for us from what we were currently doing, which was um, in my case, like transaction advisory, Alec was in private equity and investment banking. And so we somewhat had transferable skills from those jobs that we could bring over into the real estate world and specifically development. And so we really just got started by talking with brokers and, and you know, looking on LoopNet just the same way everyone else does and, and kind of figuring out which way is up in the whole pursuit for that first deal. And so we made a few good broker relationships and um, ended up leveraging one of those to put us in touch with some guys that were looking for some financing on a project in um the Auburn Hills market. And so this inevitably ended up being the building that I uh, mentioned before we got started, which is a 48 unit, 50,000 square foot ground up development in downtown Auburn Hills. So for anyone familiar with the Metro Detroit area, it's at the corner of Auburn and Squirrel Road in downtown Auburn Hills. So uh, this project, you know, we'll, we'll, we can sidestep some of the details for, for the time being to keep it brief, but um, it's been, it's been everything that we could have hoped for in a first project. And it's, it's concluding in a way that makes us proud. And um, we're pleased with what we've been able to accomplish with this project. So it's, it's really kind of set us up um, to really scale in terms of the size of the projects and the quantity of projects that we're doing as a result of this first one. And we find it 
significantly easier to interface with new financing resources or new lenders or new consultants because of the track record we've shown with just this one project. Um, so I think that's been really helpful to us. And that's where we sit now in this sort of dangerous position, dangerous in a good way, in my mind, um, where we have, you know, three projects that could hit tomorrow and um, be sort of ground running in the financing stages, moving toward PUD approval. And, um, and that's an exciting place for us because that's, you know, a lot more than we've tolerated to date. And I'm looking forward to what that would mean in terms of bringing on help and um, insulating us with even more people around us to help get these projects done. So uh, just- congratulations. It's going to push you to grow in ways you've not imagined yet, to say the least. It already has, I'm sure. I mean, doing a 48 unit uh, ground up. And so that's even, I mean, that's not a small project. And most would say, what in the world are you thinking starting with a project like that? You know, uh, and so give us a little more detail, though, just on how you had the confidence to move forward on developing a project like that right out of the gate. Of course. Yeah. So I, I tell everyone that the most important component to doing what we did was finding the right people to um, put in place as your, as your consultants, as your team. So that's architect, that's construction manager, that's civil engineer, even structural engineer, MEP engineer, um, projects, or I'm sorry, property management company, you know, insurance brokers. It's really insulating yourself with all the people that already understand how it works and what you're supposed to do and, 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 and look for people like you to be their clients. And so we were able to gain a ton of knowledge just by leveraging the experience that our team already had all around us. So that was the most helpful in the beginning. As far as the confidence, I, I've always been a pretty confident person and um, I've always known that entrepreneurship was the direction for me. So this just felt natural. And, um, you know, I've been used to running businesses and, and um, you know, having employees as early as like 16 years old. Actually, I had had my first employee when I was 15 because I, I remember because I needed them to have a driver's license so that they could pick me up because I didn't have my license yet. So I've, I've been in, a, in in that role before um, and, and have experience there and that's been helpful. And um, I got a very loving and supportive family around me and they're, they're to varying degrees involved in the business. Um, you know, and, and I, I appreciate that opportunity to work with them on everything. And, and they're really important to our team. That's definitely very helpful to have the, you know, supportive family or just that unit, right. You know, at home or, or wherever uh, that's close to you, that's supportive. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting, let's say, I don't, I don't know how long ago you started that project, but how did you get, I know there's some listeners that are thinking no, wait a minute, you know, at 25, you're probably 23 or four at the time, you know, we started this project. How'd you get people to take you serious? You, you named off all these architects, right? Uh, and I know the listeners are thinking, no, wait a minute. What, uh, what was that list of architects? How many of those people do I need to, you know, reach out to, you know, at that age, how, how do you get them to take you seriously? For, you know, you've not done this before. You know, they're thinking, no, wait a minute. Who's this Michael guy? You know, is he really going to do this? Do I give him much of my time? You know, how, what, how'd you handle that? Yeah. So I think some of it was leveraging some existing relationships. So in the case of like our construction manager, for example, um, we had a connection to someone that was involved um, with that company. And so we had a good character reference there and we had worked with this contact before on on previous real estate related stuff. Um, So that was a good segue in with them. And I think just like the sheer size of the project and the fact that we were able to, to finance a project like that, to, in the consultant's eyes, gave them the confidence that they needed. Because ultimately to the to the consultants, like if the project is feasible and is financed, like they're getting a job. So like that's really what they're looking for is someone that can bring the capital and and you know reason with, with reasonable success pull off a project like this. And I think that they just saw that capability in us. And certainly we had the the financing backing, which I haven't touched on yet, but um, I certainly can. And those two, com- the combination of those two things, I think, in the consultant size help to take us seriously. But I mean, there's certainly moments with the lender early on or with uh, municipal people early on, you know, whether it be the city council or any of the various staff members where having zero experience and never having talked to anyone at a city about any project before was very challenging. So I don't, I don't mean to paint that it was roses and, and daisies the whole time. It was, <laughs> it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life without a question, but we, we were resilient and, um, and strategic and moved quickly. And, 
um, executed what we needed to and, and found success in that. Did you, uh, did the capital come from the consultant or how did you raise the money? So we raised about 1.8 million in equity and about 7.2 million in debt. Um, the equity was a, a group of 12, you know, started out as friends and family style investors. And then some friends of friends came aboard and, and we basically just built um, a team of limited partners that were all seeking cash flow from, you know, a development operation. So the financing process on Jordan was extremely easy. I mean, we talked to like 14 people and 12 of them wanted to come aboard. And um, I think that's because the, the overall premise of the project was very easy to see the vision. Like if you stood on this site in this downtown, it just made sense that a big four story apartment building was like supposed to go here. And it just felt like that was going to be a powerful thing. And then if you looked at the market, dem not demographics, but the, um, the metrics of, you know, like vacancy rates and rent growth, uh, median income, all of which very strong in the Auburn Hills market. So I think it was easy for our investors to see those data points and, um, find confidence in the same vision that we had. And a lot of them are from the area. So they're familiar with the general vicinity. And like in the case, like my dad's case, like he um, grew up down the street and used to work at the restaurant that's kitty corner of the project. So we, at a personal level, were familiar with this area. And I think that confidence and that understanding was helpful for our investors to feel the same way about the area. For sure. All right. Well, give us give us a few more details about the project. And I know forty eight units of mixed use space. Uh, I mean, and, and some yeah, some other mixed use. Uh, what is it exactly? Uh, and how did you? Uh, I mean, I guess you know some people are going to think, no, wait a minute. You know, how did he know to make it mixed use? And, and I know you say it just fit there, but like, you know, uh, not everybody's just going to just feel that or think it just fits there, right? How did you know to use uh, to make it mixed use? How did you know to have this many units of residential versus commercial or uh, you know whatever? Of course. Yeah. So in order to answer that question, it's best to really describe sort of the overall development process and how yeah. these projects come to be in the first place. So starting with raw land, you inevitably have a certain amount of uses that you can build on raw land. The um, zoned or approved, you know, uses on that type of land. So whether that be single family residential, multifamily, office, industrial, um, something zoned that way. So then if you want to change that zoning and build something else, you can either get a rezone or conditional rezone or something called a PUD, planned urban development or planned unit development, it's sometimes called. And so in that case, um, you're able to develop really your own set of rules that have to coincide with the master plan and the vision of the municipality. But ultimately, you can um, have some flexibility on things like parking and height and setbacks. And so in the case of the Jordan, a lot of that, actually that whole process had already happened on this particular site. So we walked into a approved PUD that had stipulated all those things for us and said that, you know, the, the ground floor use is retail and that the residential use would begin on the second floor. And so um, a lot of those variables were already decided for us. Now in some of our newer projects, like we're going through that process and handling the PUD approval ourselves. And so we're getting to influence more of those variables than we did previously. Um, but, you know, overall, the project is, is really 36 one bedroom apartments that's split between two different floor plans. And then we have 12, well, really nine two bed, two baths. And then we have three, like one bed with a den. They start off as two bedrooms, but we scaled them back because they were really small. And so we just made the second one an office and then it has a one, a single bathroom in it. Um, so that's the residential component. And that's on the second, third and fourth floor elevator access, two staircases, and then on the first floor, we just have a lobby space. There's a little conference room in there. There's a desk area for um, residents to use for eating or doing work. Then there's like lounge seating and pool table, ping pong table, TV on the wall, uh, mail and package room. You know, so all these amenities that don't take up a lot of space, but are convenient to have. And that occupies the lobby space. And then the remainder of the first floor is retail. And then just behind the retail is what we call tucked in parking. So it's 14 parking spaces that sit under the second floor that are within the footprint of the building, if that makes sense. Um, so that's really the makeup of it. And uh, yeah, four stories. It's mostly brick facade. There's a little bit of what's called EFIS. Um, it's a, a exterior finish material and that's the accent on it, but beautiful building. And maybe we can share some pictures of it or something. Give me the... Give me, you know, like, or did any details of the business plan and maybe how it changed 
you know, like maybe, you know, you thought this was going to happen from the beginning or you're going to sell it at this time or keep it this long or make it this way or this many units, you know, how did that change over the life of this project? Absolutely. Yeah. So when we started this process and we're financing it, we initially set out to have a three to five year hold. So we said, build, stabilize, sell three to five years in and out. Here's our return projections. Here's our IRR in three. Here's our IRR in five. And it was a very fixed mentality, particularly driven by the fact that we had five-year debt. And so we just figured like, okay, well, we'll have our two-year interest-only construction loan, then we'll have our three-year mini-perm debt, and then we'll just sell it at that point and, um, and basically not need to get new capital for it. We now realized that we have a lot of different options. We could look at HUD as a potential refi option or potentially, um, you know, the Fannie Freddie route. Um, we weren't really considering that before. And also in the market that we're in right now with what's happened with cap rates and the price being demanded on new build, mixed use multifamily in the heart of a growing downtown area, like we really gotten aggressive on what we think we could sell this building for. And so now we're really just weighing the options between those two and have kind of parallel paths working um, to do a refinance through HUD and, you know, slap on some 35 year um, fully amortizing, you know, sub 3% interest rate, 85% leverage loan, and just cash flow that for a while. And then of course that's assumable. So we could then sell the building even before the prepayment period's done. So long as the buyer assumed it. And we think in a rising interest rate environment in the short term of the next two to three years, someone would probably be looking to step into a sub 3% rate on a cash, cash flowing asset in a strong market with rent growth. So, um, the sky's, you know, really the limit in terms of where we could take this project, whether it be the refinance, hold, optimize, and, you know, sell after five, or if we just take advantage of probably the lowest that cap rates are going to be, in my opinion, um, in the present market and, you know, look to get out of this thing for a five cap. Um, I don't think either option's bad and uh, I'm looking forward to exploring both. Definitely not a bad thing. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, you could go a number of different options and hey, you've done an amazing job, you know, uh, no doubt about it. It sounds like an amazing project. Uh, give me a, a couple, you know, big lessons learned, you know, that, that, hey, you know, if I had known this, I would have done this differently. Absolutely. Um, your budget is only as good as your drawings. So like the budget, so, so the way the process works is basically the architect puts together construction drawings and then the general contractor bids those construction drawings. Well, when the general contractor is bidding those drawings, he's bidding exactly what's drawn on the drawings. It seems pretty straightforward, right? Well, the challenge becomes when something's not detailed fully on the drawings and it's just sort of assumed or left to interpretation, or if something's just blatantly missed and not drawn at all on the drawings, the contractor doesn't bid it. So it's not included in your estimates and thus you're not planning for it. So that's, you know, therein lies a huge potential surprise down the road because basically there was nothing drawn. So there's nothing bid. So there's nothing accounted for. And then all of a sudden you need water heaters and you got to buy 48 water heaters as a stupid example, right? Like let's say the water heater wasn't drawn there and no one ever bid it. No one ordered it. Well, all of a sudden you got your budget figured out, but you have this surprise because you realize the water heaters were never in the budget in the first place. So, you know, we use what's called a guaranteed max price contract, a GMP. And the GMP, the way the phrase really goes in my mind is like the GMP is only as good as the construction drawings because it's based solely on those drawings. So that's been a huge lesson to us. We didn't, I couldn't, I literally remember a time with a civil engineer very early on in my real estate career where I did not know the difference between um, construction drawings and a site plan. And, and now being in the industry, that's a very obvious difference for anyone that's at, at all familiar with the process. So starting out, I knew absolutely none of this. And so it's been a big learning curve to figure all that out and understand how we utilize all these consultants effectively. And most importantly, how we coordinate all the consultants. So those have been huge lessons. And um, I'm working on new strategies for new projects where we're going to make some tweaks to try to optimize the way that we connect those groups and share documents and um, operate around a schedule together. So, so don't um, this, skimp on the drawings, right? What's that? Don't skimp on the drawings. Not skimp on the drawings. Pay for architecture. It's it's the. I mean, I, I'm not going to say it's more important than the construction management, but equally for sure, because one is basically building the building on paper, and the other is building the building in real life. And and you build the one on paper so that you can build the one in real life easier, better, 
you know, more efficiently, more cost effectively. Um, but if one's, if one suffers, it's, it's um, the cause of a bad project nine times out of 10. Now it makes complete sense. You got to have a plan. <laughs> you got to have an accurate plan, especially in something like that. If you're interested in multifamily real estate, but don't know how or where to begin, our guide on how to start investing in multifamily real estate breaks down everything you need to know about identifying good investments plus real world examples. Download your copy in the show notes or visit lifebridgecapital.com forward slash start now to start your journey in multifamily real estate. Uh, well, give us just a, a minute or so on like, okay, from, you know, the next deal, like, what are you moving towards? What types of projects, uh, you know, if you, if you said, oh, okay, you know, this is just not for me now, I'm going to go do something else. Or is it, nope, I love development and, and we're going to keep going this direction. The, this business is for me. I love this business and I, I will continue in this business. Um, as for how long, I don't know. I would consider at least a decade, a long time at this point. And then maybe after that, I'll transition to something else. But I'm, I drank the Kool-Aid and um, I see the potential with this, with this business. And that's really evident in the pipeline that we're working on right now. So of the three projects, um, one's about a five and a half million dollar project. It's a four story mixed use actually across the street from our current Auburn Hills project. The second one is a 2.2 acre, 22 unit development, real upscale townhomes in a suburb of Metro Detroit, right off a major highway. And then the third one is a 27 acre, 200 unit, $36 million project, which would um, really provide a first of its kind asset type to this market. A lot of the existing product is garden style and sprawling and, um, you know, not necessarily multi-story common hall high amenity. And that's what we would be bringing. And so this market's somewhat connected to the performance of the Auburn Hills market. And so we're relying a lot on what's going on in Auburn Hills and just the broader area of this county. But, you know, we think 200 units is certainly sufficient um, and can be absorbed in this market. We think the rents would be north of $2 a square foot, which is an important metric that we look at. And um, probably the coolest aspect of this deal is that there's about 12 acres to the north of where we're gonna build the apartment building that we don't need for the apartment and we don't need for parking. So we're going to preserve all 12 acres and then turn that into a nature preserve for our residents. So that's something I'm most excited about because that is on the list of unique amenities that's at the top. It's really tough to emulate that because no one ever buys 12 acres just to do that. But in our case, we just had the extra land and um, didn't need it for either apartments or parking. So it just worked out. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really most excited about that project. And that one's going through PUD process right now. Uh, so it's going to be a little tight because we basically had to get into a contract that required that we closed on the land within six months with no extensions and then had a hard money deposit involved. So it, it, it's going to be an all out sprint to get that one done. But it's um, it, it's the next logical step for us in, in our ladder. And, yeah, it's um, a big step to say the least. I know it's yeah. awesome. How are you going to raise the money for that project? That's going to be a challenging process. So we need about nine million. And so I don't think our friends and family circle could support 9 million or at least not very efficiently. So what we'll likely do is carve out a couple different tranches of equity and one will be a sponsor class. So we'll probably look for something like 20 to 25% of the equity from a loan sponsor candidate. And then their promote and split of the profits would be sufficient to justify their added risk of sponsoring the loan. Plus they'd be earning the pref return on that 25% of the equity that they put in. So that's going to be a very important piece. And on our, on our current deal that we're financing, we decided to bifurcate the loan sponsorship requirement and we spread it out amongst five different investors. It was, it worked and it will work. And I'm, you know, excited about how it's going to work, but on the, a project of this size, it would be too challenging to try to split a sponsorship of a $30 million loan or a $27 million loan amongst 10 different investors. So we're going to look for one large institutional or family office to fill that tranche. And then we'll probably rely on um, maybe like some 10% pref, no split money for maybe 25% of the equity. And then we'll probably raise about the other 50% from friends and family or just high net worths and, and just have a, a class for them that's, um, you know, somewhat lower return than what the sponsor class would be earning, but um, higher return than what just like a pref investor would be earning. You yeah. know, so maybe 
12 to 15 percent um, return for yeah, that. Yeah, it's a big jump from what 1.8 to, to nine, right? Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, I got to have some plans there, no doubt about it. Uh, and so, you know, just thinking about it as you're moving into the development space, I actually I wanted to back up and I wanted to ask you a, one more question from early on because it sounded like sounded like a crucial piece in the success of this 48 unit was like you're the consultant that you hired, you know, mm-hmm. and like, you know, obviously your team. And we talk about that often on the show, but provide just, you know, just a little bit of guidance there on how you fi- found a consultant that you trusted like that, that was that helpful to help you, you know, be, have a success on this first project. Mm-hmm. Of course. So one of the most serendipitous relationships that we developed was with our architect. So he just happened to be building the building that was immediately across the street from the Jordan project. And so I one day Googled what the name was because they you know, had the sign on the building um, and I had no idea. I'd never heard of Design House before. And uh, sure enough, Googled the name, figure out, figured out they're an architecture firm, figured out they designed multifamily buildings. And I knew for a fact that whoever was the head honcho over there would definitely want to design the building that's going to be right next to their office building. So I felt like it was a good fit. And um, we're also in a situation where like one iteration of the drawings had already been done by an architect and it was going to be basically double the price to get them updated. That, that's kind of a whole different story. We'll just leave that aside for now. But um, basically <laughs> we had to go to this architect with, with not a lot of time and not a lot of budget to be able to get him to design this building. And so because it was, right next to um, his headquarters. He liked the idea of being able to design that building and, and saw the potential in us. And um, we, we really just kind of saw eye to eye from day one. Like we had always um, really liked the way that he conducted his business and the way that he designed buildings. And obviously we didn't have a whole lot of experience with it, but it just felt comfortable and it felt right. Um, so, you know, I guess the advice would be um, find someone that makes you feel that way because you're not going to know the technicalities and the technical differences between this architect and that architect until you have the experience. So just there, there is a a huge element of gut feel to it and, and knowledge and, and also like manpower. So like analyze a firm, like if they don't have a lot of analysts around and like the higher level people, the management VPs are like doing a lot of the grunt work of like updating drawings or like doing the drafting Um, that's going to bog down progress and that's going to bottleneck progress. So you want to look at the size of the team of the consultant too, and make sure that they're sufficient to, to pump out at the capacity level that, that you need. So no, um, that's that's really awesome. Yeah. It's just great to think through how it sounds like you just, you built an amazing team. You know, you met some key people and, and you obviously took a lot of hard work on your part, but, but, uh, the team components is so crucial no matter how experienced you are, uh, ultimately, uh, but you know, as you move forward and scaling your development business, Michael, and, uh, you know, how, how do you prepare for, say, a potential downturn? How do you think about that when you're, I'm sure you get that question from potential investors or, or people in the business? Of course. Yeah. I mean, the nature of our business is it is inherently cyclical. And we've seen examples of that time and time again. So to, to neglect the potential of a downturn is irresponsible. And uh, we certainly don't. Um, but we also know that you can't live in fear of the cycle and you can not try to time the market in a lot of ways. You just have to exist in it and make prudent decisions that aren't over leveraged and aren't based on um, inaccurate assumptions and, and build in contingencies to projects that are capable of handling the rainy day surprise. And I think by doing those things, you inevitably prepare yourself for when that when that turn in the cycle does come. Um, And so I think obviously you have to assess the situation. If you were in the hotel business and I was just coming out of the ground on a new hotel development in March of 2020, I don't think I would have finished that project um, or at least continued to work on it because, you know, I'm looking at this, this giant um, pandemic right in my face. So I think you just have to obviously be aware of influences on your particular style of development and, what the driving forces of that are and be cognizant of those. And, um, and that's, that's what we strive to do in the multifamily world, but I guess more nuts and bolts on the multifamily. Like we all know that multifamily is one of the best performing asset classes, both in positive market cycles and negative market cycles. 
And so we're confident in that fact and feel like inherently with the diverse tenant mix that's brought with multifamily and with the high rent growth and just the fundamental need that apartments provide to people being their home and shelter. Um, those are also things that get us comfortable about, you know, in a negative period or in a downturn period. Um, you know, we just need to be able to preserve capital, hold on to assets, squeak out cash flow where possible, and 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 preserve capital once again. <laughs> That's right. I was going to say preserving hours. capital is so important. Uh, oh. No doubt about it. Uh, you never want to to lose the capital uh, in any any way, shape, or form, if at all possible. But uh, uh, no, I appreciate you just elaborating on that. It's just different thinking about developing a project, you know, and some of the risks there. I hear that sometimes as well as we've started doing some developments also, and uh, and so just a different different beast, right? You know, our team changed as well. You know, or added more team members. You know, uh, with different expertise. Uh, and so, Michael, you know, accomplishing what you have. It doesn't happen without uh, being somewhat disciplined, uh, you know, and, and having many probably daily habits or, or at least things that, that you, uh, you know, probably could relate to the success to and, and probably over a long period of time. And what would a few of those be? Any daily habits that have helped you achieve success? So I've recently become um, much more integrated with my calendar. I, for a long time, and when I started in this business um, and in previous jobs, I had never, I always neglected my calendar. And so recently um, what I've been focusing on is pre-scheduling my entire day. So obviously I'll have breaks and flexibility and, and, and some windows in there for adjustment. But if I have a task or something to do, I schedule it out as opposed to just have my to-do list, have a free block of time and have to try to just guess at what, you know, I need to, is most important that I execute. I, I, pre-plan that or try to the day before so that when I'm in go time from, you know, morning to night of a work day, um, I can just execute and I don't have to think about um, how to prioritize or what to prioritize or what else I need to do. I'm just confident in the fact that I've prepared myself a day that's uh, basically delivering on what needs to get done. And that's helped me a lot because I, I think it helps to reduce, you know, worry and anxiety about, different things that are on your plate. Um, if you know that there's a time that you've put it on your calendar that's coming up in the next 24, 48 hours, you're going to be more at ease about needing to get that thing done than if it's just item number six on your to-do list and you're staring at it as you're doing one through five. Um, so that's been very helpful for me. And, and I'm certainly not um, perfect at it. In fact, I'm not even good at it yet, but I, I know that it works for me. So I'm, I'm really working on um, implementing that and sticking to that and, and making that more of a priority. And I think that's been a, a good secret weapon for me. Um, it's kind of like having your site plan, right? Exactly. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. I think yeah. there's, there's a lot of comfort in uh, the certainty of a full schedule. And, um, you know, some people think like, Oh, well, I don't have a free minute all day. So, I mean, you do want to bake in 15 minutes here and make lunch an hour instead of 45 minutes. So you have 15 extra minutes to do what you got to do there. So you're not actually minute to minute, but it's been really helpful for me. And then beyond that, I just stay really active. So I, I love to golf. Um, I love to ski. I love to work out. And so I'll, I'll, I'll do that four or five times a week between all those different things. And that helps to detach from everything else I got going on because when you got a development business, we got a, um, like a electronic access control. We're a, a wholesale distributor for an electronic access business. So we got that going. Now we're like operating Jordan. We've got these new developments coming in. So there's a lot of hats I'm wearing and it's tough to keep all of that, um, separated and focused on. So, you know, being able to detach a little bit and, and be active and then come back to that planned calendar is a nice transition, a nice balance. How do you like to give back? What's that? How do you like to give back? You know, um, I, I have a, a strong desire to get more involved with my high school. So I'm, I was a um, pretty involved student there. I, I played a lot of sports. I was a part of their, um, oh, like the, so I ran the varsity club, which was like responsible for school spirit. And we put on the pep rallies and I would be the host of the pep rallies and all that good stuff. So like, I've just always been passionate about school sports at my high school. And so I, I would like to um, develop a relationship over there where I can uh, contribute, you know, to the operation there and, and give back. And so that's something that's on the to-do list on the horizon. 
Um, you know, I also, I also think giving back in a way that, um, can be mutually beneficial to like, okay, as an example, one of the ways that I want to connect with my high school is to partner with the robotics team and share with them some of the challenges that we face in the development business and start to think about how certain robots or automations could help to improve, you know, the construction process. So that could be as simple as once a month meeting and just a good experience for, you know, the people that are involved in the robotics group or, that could scale into something incredible where it turns out they actually developed a, a potential prototype that has the feasibility to automatically install drywall in a development as an example. Um, and then that can, you know, that, that could be future employment for those students that could be future funding that could turn into an endowment and that could um, be a financing mechanism. And, and, and so I, I think there's a lot of opportunity in, in the, in the spirit of philanthropy. And that's, that's one of the ways that I see that kind of playing out. So but, um, that's awesome. I can definitely see you being an inspiration to, to those, you know, to the people there and, and uh, not only cause you, you went to school there, but, but also just because you're, you're making big things happen at a very young age and Hey, that it kind of gives them hope. I think too, you know, what they think, or they probably have blinders on just like I did, you know, you, you're just not exposed to those things. Uh, many are not, you know, at a young age and you just don't even know that these things are out there, that the, uh, there's so many options, right. That uh, you can go and tackle it and, and often achieve bigger things than what your, your mind can imagine at the moment. Um, and, and if they can develop a, a robot that can finish drywall, I'll, I'll be all over it. <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely have one of those. Uh, but uh, you know, I watch these guys install it and I'm like, there's gotta be a better way. Like they, um, they're taking 40, 50, 50% of the drywall back out of the building because it's scrap. And I'm thinking to myself, like, man, if you just had a robot that cut this perfectly and lifted it up here and anyway, so I, I think there's something there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll, no we'll, doubt about we'll, it. We'll no doubt. Well, Michael, pleasure to meet you and have you on the show. Congratulations on this, on this project. I mean, a successful project, this 48 unit, uh, and even the sites towards this other much larger deal. Um, and just, you know, just that you're going after it, right. It, you're not intimidated and, and staying back and, you know, waiting or, you know, trying to figure out small steps. I mean, you were, you were going after it and figuring out the way and building the team to make it happen successfully. Uh, just congratulations uh, on doing that. It's not the typical path for most, right? And so I just, I love that you're, uh, you're just tackling it head on and, and making it happen. Tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you. Awesome. Yeah, well, I really appreciate that, Whitney. Um, I'm most active probably on Instagram. So I, I used to just post on my personal, my real estate stuff. And then I realized I should probably uh, give all my friends and family a break on all the real estate content. So I made a separate Instagram account. That one is at multifam Mike. So we can link that in the description maybe. And then my personal ones, uh, M-I-K-E-E underscore Wayne. And so I'm active on both of those. Um, LinkedIn and then our website, shortrichsidecapital.com. There's a contact form on there. Um, for any purpose, anyone that wants to get in touch with us, anyone that wants to work with us, investors, new projects, whatever it is, um, just going through that link and, and shooting us over whatever information that hits our inbox. Um, we'll see it right away. So it's another great way to get in, in contact with me. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.